So I actually wait for this beer all year to come out because it's one of my favorite ales and from Ninkasi, which I dig a bunch. So it came out, I got a six pack and here is me trying it for the first time. Let me just set my... It says second zero. I just saw this walking back, decided to get it. It's a winter ale by Nankasi. Again, 12 months waiting for it to come out again. Smoky this year, but let's do the boundary layer now. You may have heard about the boundary layer. Um, I imagine maybe it's been in like your other classes you've taken. I hope it has, but today is the boundary layer. Boundary layer is important. Boundary layer is something that ties together so much of the Navier-Stokes equations that we've seen so far. It's really a fundamental part about the structure of them. And it has fantastical things, and it's just a huge thing of study for so much of fluids. And boundary layers exist really in many places. So there's like entrance flow effects. Remember long ago, right, we had this situation where we had flow moving into a pipe like this. <clears throat> and then sort of at some level of an entrance length, what did we have? We had fully developed. We've described fully developed in multiple different ways at this point. But fully developed was a situation, right, was this, right? This was when, in some argument, this term was equal to zero, or didn't really matter in a scale sense, right? And then before here, you have a changing, before here, you have really this sort of changing um, velocity profile inside this internal flow, OK? So you have a changing velocity profile. We're now at x in there. We're now just. Maybe you understand that now the difference is that my velocity profile as I move down to my x-coordinate, it's certainly not zero. There's a change in there. I never really mentioned this stuff right here. <coughs> I never really mentioned this part right here. But then if you go back, we had potential flow theory. And you could think of this maybe at the very center as a potential flow type theory, or right here. We separate these, and I put some sort of sink in the very center of here. And then I would deal with this flow field irrotationally. Or inviscid. I'm going to say inviscid a lot in this lecture because I just prefer to think of I'd like to think of it that way. So just inviscid flow. So here, prior to the going entering the pipe, we could have modeled this a section of initially still liquid, and then all of it slowly sort of converging in here because there's a pressure gradient occurring right here. This could be modeled as an irrotational inviscid flow. Essentially, what's going to happen is you would have some sort of little box of fluid right there, and the pressure gradient steep enough or slow enough that it would still be there be no shearing here, or it's irrotational, right? And then it would move into here. And then these viscous forces would now start to occur. <clears throat> okay, so then here you start to actually have some sort of shearing effects. Right, and then essentially you get to some sort of normal shearing effect right here. 
Where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from, as we described before, this idea that there's walls right here, no slip has to obey, so viscous forces or vorticity will diffuse through the wall, affecting the flow. Where right here, the boundary really isn't that affected. So there actually is a region here, right, since there's a boundary right there as well, where viscous forces matter as well, right? Right, even this flow right here that's being dragged out, right, this flow that's being here that's being moved along this one and then right around the corner, there's even boundary layers there as well. So really sort of your sink has to be kind of far away from there. But there's this area where you have this combination of fluid that's still in resisting motion and viscous forces that are shearing that motion. So that is this interaction between inertial flow, inertia and viscosity. Okay. And then this is just an internal one, but then even sort of a flat plate sitting in liquid okay, we still have this scenario where let's say I have incoming flow that's just constant. <clears throat> what occurs here And this is just experimental, even. Assigning some coordinates, x, there is some distance delta we call the viscous length. I've seen and quoted it many times, right? It's the viscous length scale. It's this issue, right, where here is still in viscid flow. Okay, out here, and then right here you have a laminar, right, viscous flow on the inside of this, and then outside of it you again have your inviscid, inviscid flow, <clears throat> right? So here you have, you're generating these like these changing velocity profiles here. And this is this boundary layer. There's even one happening in here, right? I mean, this is just a plate. You could just map this identical type of situation. If you imagine the center of your pipe is f infinitely far away, you would again get this concept The viscous part of the fluid developing as I, right, as I move across from this side. And then what's called on in the internal part the inviscid core. <clears throat> right? I mean, what's a way to even see this inviscid core develop, right? I mean, these velocity profiles, they kind of look flat, and then, less, and then less part of that is flat, and then there's basically no part of it that's flat. And what's happening is your inviscid core is going away as you go into the pipe, because the viscous forces are taking over. So an inviscid core, and an internal part is a decaying quantity. In exterior flow, the inviscid core of flow is just always existent, but you know, far, far away. So an important idea with this internal flow is boundary layers exist, but they're Right, if, it's, if the flow is slow enough, then they will be disappearing quantities because these boundary layers will meet up, right? And you can just plot them or you could even just sort of go like, oh, I can, you know, I can see where the inviscid flow occurs because if you have changing velocity profiles, right? I mean, it's sort of just like, you know, tracing a line of like this, this flat part here. See how these velocity profiles are flat? Well, that's going to be your inviscid core. And it's going to decay away as we move along.
what's happening here, right? Same situation, you have flow moving over the plate, or likewise, you could have a plate that you drag through still liquid by a transformation coordinate so that that's the same motion. What, and right, and so here, right, and, that, and that's exactly what you have. From here, you have this inertial flow of, of, flu, of fluid moving on this, right, a fluid resistance to motion from being close to here. And then the viscous part, you then have these viscous forces causing us no slip at the, no slip at the wall. That's what these step, velocity flow, that's what these velocity profiles really are doing, right? They always look like this where they just decay quickly down to a zero no slip condition. We always believe no slip. Then the far more complicated version, don't, not even thinking of a flat plate, sort of thinking about all of the things together, right? You have some sort of slender body or smooth body, right? And you also keep, put it in some sort of external flow field, okay? These will have some streamlines, and they'll come down to a point there, at the stagnation point. Why does the stagnation point exist? Well, it exists because the Lagrangian point of view of fluid flow is valid, and that just means that if the Lagrangian fluid point of fluid flow is valid, that means I can always draw these, and these stagnation points must exist because if I can draw this, there must be a point where the tangent doesn't exist, so that means there's a point when the velocity has to equal zero. It'd be an inconsistent theory if we could never say a stagnation point exists. Okay, so then once it reaches this point, then you have a developing boundary layer around both bodies, and you get situations that will look like this, right? <clears throat> Keep drawing these. <clears throat> And then at this some point then you get then awake and then everything's kind of popping up. And then far, far away, right? Far, far away, sort of even further down the line, similarly, right? You even still have these streamlines that go back down. Right. So, and contained in this whole situation right here is really everything. Okay? So, this is my smooth body. <laughs> this is my smooth body. <laughs> it's not really that smooth. <laughs> All right. So, here you have this external flow field. What's happening here? This is, again, inviscid. What's this condition for inviscid? Well, this is part of the entire flow field where this is 0 all around here. And then you have two types of different, not right, we have two types of different flows where they become inviscid, not inviscid, right? Over here in this part, you have the laminar boundary layer part, right? So in this flow, this is your laminar boundary layer, right? It's a laminar boundary layer because it's applying, it has no slip on the surface, and there are some other conditions we can talk about, essentially a laminar part, where you have flow that starts from zero velocity here, but then must be accelerated around the body. So I go from zero, as I move anywhere away, fluid must be accelerated. So I have changing flow, and then at this point, the flow must slow down. Think about it because almost imagine this expanding duct. I mean, between any two streamlines on this body, that's one of the easier way to think about boundary layers, right? If I just consider these two flows right here, I have flow chugging along, and now imagine this, the insides of walls or interiors of pipe walls. Well, now fluid must accelerate because I have a shrinking area, so conservation of masses as area goes down, the flow rate must go up in velocities. So as this goes down, a flow must, right, flow must increase in speed, so then I get to at some point, and now my streamline moves far away. So now I have a decelerating flow. And that deceleration causes something called separation, and then you get all this stuff happening here. So very importantly, there's sort of two sections where this fails here. Okay? This is not zero here, because viscous forces certainly matter. 
<coughs> and then on the and then over here in the separation point, right? We have uh, we have the same condition holding, but it's not really the viscous forces that are making the flow rotational. It's more the fact, right? It's more the fact that I've that now the vorticity's blown up, or sort of you have now three dimensional flow. So all the parts of the flow are here. You have this inviscid flow going over it, and that will exist on the far edges of this external flow, and even back behind it. In my covered case. And then, right on here, when you have this approach, when you have this bolt, when you have this stagnation point, you have a, you have a blunt body or a smoothish body where the curvature is not blown into too extreme. You have this area of accelerated flow, no slip, and you have this area where laminar viscous effects matter, and I'm trying to characterize and trying to find the solution, really, of this part right here. So all today, we will talk about every sort of, every sort of analysis, or really general analysis, for these parts right here. Okay. Now, past this point, certainly a bunch of stuff happens. Past that is something called slip separation. But boundary layer theory, keep this in your head, ends at separation. Right? You, all we're talking about is this little tiny section of the flow, past at which you know the flow separated, so all of the equations have changed, so now you no longer talk about that. So, if I were to test you on the validity of where boundary layer theory is, has, you should know that. And you should know that for the rest of your life as someone in fluid dynamics, that you're really only describing this very tiny, very tiny region of bodies that are experiencing this um, acceleration of flow because of converging or change of body, right? Or because of a change of right, shape and geometry. There's not really even, there's not really one right here, but there is this issue of um, these streamlines did have to move away and things like this will occur. This is stuff over here where you have this turbulent wake, right, or very, very, very rotationally heavy flow where you add a bunch of vorticity in there, pass there. It is three-dimensional. If you take oil films and put them on the edge of a, of a body, and then you would see, right, essentially right here, you would see this smooth sort of laminar effect where things didn't change. Past that point where the wake is occurring, you would see a lot of spiral and concentrated regions where these spindles of their vorticity end up shooting off of the, um, end up really shooting off of the uh, 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 surface. <clears throat> so that's, that, that's, the, that's the amazing far-reaching uh, concept of this boundary layer theory, is you get insight even to the most complicated things, right? Just in understanding that there's this area where these things matter. Now that's cool in itself, I think, just to like be able to like describe to the equations what's going on. But it also handles and gives you an idea of how the pressure and forces are happening on bodies. So right, in this situation, it's a classic problem. Really your goal, Right, you're really, this whole thing is you're trying to find the shear at the wall. If you find that shear force at the wall, right, this allows you, what's it allow you to do? It allows you to figure out drag, right, a part of the drag, or the skin friction. If you can calculate the skin friction that's happening on your body in external flows, you can calculate, say, the power to move a submarine, or the power to move a boat. And that was some of the largest money that went into this, like Prandtl and people like that. A lot of their money was from naval academies because it's a very, very large boat. There's a bunch of surface on there. So if you're trying to size with some sort of pump or motor or propellers to move your device or get it right, you have to have some understanding of how the area and what viscous forces of the water, even how small they are, if I have very, very large areas that are all experiencing viscous drag, even in this one little surface, I should account for it. I should account for it at least somewhat. <clears throat> certainly your first order, your, certainly your first order um, approximations could be done with this potential theory, with this inviscid flow theory, 
where you had that coefficient of drag graph where it went down and went back up, total pressure recovery. Notice this is the issue of no pressure recovery, right? You have go, right? This is the idea of no pressure. The energy, the energy of flow moved into the other dimensions. You, you lose it in 2D. So that's really the purpose of this. Other than that, it's a fantastical cool theory. And you even get to see how <coughs> the Navier-Stokes equations themselves are a singular asymptotic problem. Remember singular asymptotics? Whoa, I need a new eraser. <clears throat> what else? Oh, even on, this, even on this imagine. It could be a sphere or some blunt body as well. Um, however you want to do it. But you also notice that this, that this behavior really is only happening, right, when <coughs> the Reynolds number of the flow is greater than a Reynolds sort of critical. Say critical like that. Nope, I was going to say critical. And for internal and external flows, they are different values. So the internal flow, right, so the, this internal flow where you have this development of these internal flows, right, I think this one's like 10 to the 5, yeah, 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the 5, and then for internal flows, it's like 2,000 or 2,100. Pick 2,100, be conservative. <coughs> and we have, Z, we have no, and we have no way of ever estimating this parameter of the Navier-Stokes equations that will tell you when, essentially, these trip to turbulence will happen, or this trip, right? You have no way of describing, right, right when, these, when, these, when these issues arise of that critical. It has to be done experimentally. <clears throat> OK. So just from this picture that you see on bodies, what are some um, intuitive things that we should expect from this theory of a boundary layer theory? So just um, sort of just making a list of things. So boundary layers. They happen close to the surface. That's not that hard to see just from seeing a bunch of experimental things. I mean, really, if you zoom out, I mean, if you zoom out on this image of, 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 of experiments, right, you almost never even see this. It's just so thin that you can't, you can't really see that it's there. You almost only see the turbulent wake, right? Because no slip can be hard to see the, the larger the Reynolds number is. <clears throat> Two, what else should we expect on this thing? Well, you we do these experiments, and it also kind of makes sense that, well, if I'm ha I have this battle, right, of viscous flow and inviscid flow or inertial flows that are happening, right? I have the battle of resistance of motion due to the mass of the fluid battling the resistance of, right, the shearing forces of, this vis of these viscous forces in the fluid, and that battle is what's describing this viscous, right, this boundary layer. Okay. So So, you know, one way to think about it is you know, sort of that, that I know this this distance at which the forces, right, this distance is which, right, I mean, what is it? this distance is sort of telling you the region where the viscous and inviscid parts are, are converging towards each other, where there's some balance of those forces. So you should imagine that this boundary layer should be a function of the Reynolds number, which is a ratio of that. Okay. So sort of then the last fantastic idea then is that boundary layer is, a, is really a, a matched asymptotic theory, then. You can see it later in the equations, right?
The laundry layers, right, in the sense of asymptotics, they are talking about a matching happening between the inviscid flow and the viscous flow. So um, one way to think about this is even if this, right, I mean, this, if this entire field, let's say, looks like that, right, <clears throat> or even an x, a y, and a z, the idea that this boundary layer, what it has to be doing then is I have to be describing Okay, so this y, I need to, need to sort of show you what I'm talking about. I'm saying like this idea if I have normal coordinates where this is the y on some sort of body right here. So I've zoomed in pretty close and this is the x. The idea that it's this y gets very, very far away in the sense of a wall coordinate that it matches up with this inviscid flow. Right. So this, could really, this really should be some sort of s, streamwise coordinate. So this, right, as I move along, here's the surface, S. So this is really an S value. Yes. OK, so the streamwise coordinate or this inviscid part far away, this idea that in terms of this, as I move far away, I should just recover that inviscid flow. But I still need to be able to obey no slip. So then whatever, right, depending on this, if I go down to y on the coordinate, I have to have no slip there as well. So it's this matching thing that we're going to try, that you, this is matching concept that you're trying to get at when it comes to a boundary layer. It's this combination of all the viscous and inviscous, inviscous, inviscid effects of the flow. It's a dirty right there. So, what's next? Okay, let's then do the, and sort of uh, let's think about number three then with this inviscid matching principle. So you have our Navier-Stokes equations. Put them in this symbolic form. First thing for boundary layers, is the pressure is going to be normalized, is normalized by the dynamic pressure, right? This rho u squared. Why do you do that? Well, because all boundary layers, the dominant energy in the flow is the motion of the inviscid part. If you think of the entire pressure field that's happening for boundary layer flows, right? Since it's really, since we imagine it's really fast enough, the pressure, the pressure field itself scales like this, where u naught is the inviscid flow part. <clears throat> okay, so you just do your non-dimensionalization. Oh, four steady phenomena. Boundary layer is also for for everything. We're going to say steady flow. So no sort of oscillating boundary layers. I think they can be done, but I, I don't really see the steady boundary layer is usually commonly just a steady phenomena. So you always study the steady case. So you never really consider this case for boundary layer equations. You could if you're getting your PhD, I think, in something. But for us, right, the classical boundary theory does not involve any sort of steady problem. It's just this issue of this occurring. Right? So you then non-dimensionalize these equations. And you've seen these before. You get this governing equation. So I have stars, stars. And that's with this non-dimensionalization. <clears throat> yeah. 
Okay, and then what do you then use? What is your Reynolds number? Well, the Reynolds number is made with all inviscid effects. So all the inviscid flow effects come up to make the boundary layer. So for that would be the U infinity, some length scale of that, and then kinematic viscosity of the flow. Um, I should have kept this up. Where this L, right, is sort of maybe the length of your body. Right, the, right, this, this capital L could be like the length of the body, right, characteristic length of the body. So you have some sort of sitting in the flow like this. Well, it could be like that. If it's just an infinite flat plate, though, it could just be variably moving larger and larger and larger. <clears throat> so the idea about the inviscid flow, right, the Reynolds number is taken with respect to all inviscid parameters. And then, uh, then things will occur. So the one thing about, right, so with boundary layer thing, we also always, say, we, right, asymptotically we say, well, the Reynolds number is going to be really big, right? I don't have the case where Reynolds number is extremely small because I would never get this inviscid part of flow to begin with. If it was very viscous flow, and the Reynolds would be, right, and the Reynolds is just enormously tiny, right, then this is, was the wrong scaling. Okay, say that again, right? So, right, for boundary layer theories, you, assume, so you already make the assumption that the Reynolds number is very large. I have somewhat fast flow occurring in the, in the, in the, out, in the exterior part. And that's dominated by even this assumption right here, that the relevant, energy, the, the relevant physics happening is dominated by, that, by the, right, the kinetic energy per unit volume of the entire field. It's moving fairly fast enough that this is most of, that the energy, that the energy in my little box is mostly kinetic energy. Okay? If it was not that, if it was that the case, and Reynolds number was very tiny, this was, the, this was the wrong scaling to do. That would be something called Stokes flow, the, 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 the physics of marbles moving through honey, etc. And it's different physics. So this idea that you cannot say in this happening thing that the Reynolds number is, so the idea is the Reynolds number is large, or large-ish. We just don't know how large-ish means. <clears throat> But in the asymptotic sense, right, you can, right, in the asymptotic sense, you then say, okay, well, that means I have my small parameter here. It's going to zero. What does that tell you? What happened then? Well, what happened is what we already saw before. It may be a vector equation, but then we have a singular, right? It's a singular term. So fundamentally, Right, for boundary layer theories or most flows in general, if your length scales or Reynolds numbers are getting large, right, L can even make Reynolds number get pretty large, you're getting a singular term in the Navier Stokes equations. Where if I solve, right, if I solve that zeroth order equation, I lose information about the curvature of the velocity field and I can't satisfy my no slip condition. We've seen this over and over again, but this is really where it's coming down to. The navier stokes equations have this issue where if I non-dimensionalize them, I have a singularities based on my parameter called Reynolds number. So with a zeroth order equation then, so And it ends up looking like this. So it ends up the correct expansion are half powers of the Reynolds number, not full powers. You'd be missing a ter you would be missing a whole you'd be missing dynamics, right? You'd be missing interactions if you just skip this term right here. Don't worry where this comes from. We can talk about it, and you'll see why it's a half power. Okay, so the expansion where it looks like this. So in some sense, this is what, right, asymptotically, we can say this. It's called higher order boundary layer theories. Extremely rich. We won't do it here because I'll show you the classical Faulkner scan solutions. But this is really, I think, the best way to see how everything turns on and off on the boundary layer. I, I would, uh, if, I, if, I, if I do the asymptotics class, I would do boundary layer this way. It has an example, even, even in a vector format, asymptotics is still giving you something to say. Remember, you can always say, you can always say something's asymptotically equal to. This tilde symbol gives you a lot of power because you can just plug that into this thing and chug along and derive order equations. But, right, so 
when you get the zeroth order one, what's your equation? Just your Euler's, equa Euler's equation, Euler's equations of motion. These can't satisfy no slip. It's a potential flow problem. If you have a boundary, there'll be velocity on that boundary. So we know they're wrong. But what they are is the zeroth order solution. So in an asymptotic sense, when we were doing potential flows around bodies, we were doing a poor job because we were just doing this, ver this zeroth order term. It's that outer flow. And then even worse, because it's singular, it doesn't even look like this, right? Actually, each term of them has, what did, right, what did, we, do for, what did we do for the asymptotic step? We had this term that was the outer solution, then there's an inner solution, then you minus off the common part, and then you would have the full zeroth order term. The same thing would be for this, the same thing would be for this. So maybe I should rewrite this expansion. Right? Boundary layer fundamentally is saying then, well, Right, this is right. The right, the my small term is really right. One over is is really one over the one one over the square root of the Reynolds, and this could then just be your other sort of epsilon. But the form is then going to look like this. So I have an outer solution governed by potential flow, the inviscid flow part, and then I have this inner flow problem, which is close to the wall, the rescaled variables that are close to this surface. Same thing as you did for these example problems, but fundamentally, Navier-Stokes can be seen as that, where the solution asymptotically could look like this if there are boundary layers involved. Boundary layers mean there's a boundary of a flow happening somewhere. What, what am I leaving off on this, though? I will test you on this, right? It's true that flow and then it's, it's true the solution of the Navier Stokes equation somewhat looks like this, given what? Given. Right, given that the Reynolds number is going very large. This is not what the solution looks like when the Reynolds number is going very small. That has a different expansion. That's something called Stokes flow. You don't even need to do an asymptotic expansion for something like that. Okay? So again, asymptotic expansions have parameters, and you have to say with respect to how that parameter is, right, with respect to where that parameter is going. In boundary layer theory, we're just saying that the Reynolds number is getting large. So then this would be the outer. And then when you would rescale, you'd have another set of equations, and they would look like this. Okay. All I've done here is I do a rescaling of the gradient operator. To keep the pressure around to drive both of them. So this is inner. 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 <clears throat> and this rescaling ends up being that by And then same with the no slip when this value is going to infinity a condition holds because it's the inner it's the inner variable. <laughs> Maybe you just understand or appreciate this asymptotic thing better where this inner and outer things are coming from. If sense navier stokes equation has one parameter in it when it comes to keeping the nonlinear term around, 
I can think of the solution of it being having some expansion in this sense. So then I now have to solve these inner and outer problems. That's really what we're doing behind the scenes this whole lecture. Okay. <clears throat> so we have our sort of body existing in flow. I have my external inviscid flow that's happening. So this U infinity, right, is the solution of if I were to solve this problem like it was a potential flow problem. Why well, would you solve the potential flow problem? Well, analytically, you could just use, right, you could do some type of trick with a complex potential. Or numerically, you would just be solving Poisson's equation with some set with, right, with some set boundary right here, some set domain. But it's doable. It's, not, it's certainly not the hardest thing in the world. Okay, and then we have this sense of streamwise coordinates okay, that are on the body. So y is equal to 0 is it placed on the body. That's where my coordinate system occurs. Trying to get this type of relationships. And then the top of this plant, the top of this thing is the inviscid flow. All right, so I have this is the inviscid solution. All right, the delta is really the viscous length. Or I think of it as a rescaling of a coordinate. What else do you have? That's the characteristic length of the body itself. Um, anything else? Oh, yeah, this is surface coordinate. So the x, even if I zoom further in here, we have this as an idea that even x could turn into an s if I parameterize the surface. can make it look flat. So x is a surface coordinate. Wherever this is going, I'm really sort of just going along with x. So if the body's smooth enough, really like, you somehow have made a coordinate system that looks like that, kind of curves down like that, you just it's a change of coordinates. And every one of these, you have a perpendicular y as it moves along with it. These are just coordinates happening on there. Okay, what did we say before? So in all of this theory as well, the Reynolds number is taken with the inviscid flow, the length scale of the body, and the medium properties of the fluid medium. <clears throat> okay, so let's write down navier stokes equation. So we have continuity. I don't know why I do this so much. I don't know why. I still don't want my notes. I'm scared. Here are all the components. I'm writing components now. A lot of people don't like symbolic pressure gradient. How much time this takes up to write down every component. Would be nice after you leave this class if you could also remember how to do. If you could just, <laughs> I guess that's also a goal. I'm gonna make you work hard on your homeworks. But if you could, at the end of this class, just bang these equations out anytime, anywhere, maybe I succeeded. So these are the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations. <clears throat> so boundary layer is. Easily considered also for 2D flows. Like we've done everything, I've never really considered a 3D flow as well, because you need some sort of axisymmetric part, part happening. The easiest thing you do in fluids is maybe break up things into two-dimensional planes and like try and solve it that way. So again, also two-dimensional theory is also something that we have for boundary layers. I want to get rid of one. You want to get rid of one of the coordinates, either through a symmetry condition or something else. So here are the component equations themselves. <clears throat> what do you do when you write down the full Navier source equations? You pick some scales that you want to have them done at. Okay, so what are the scales? I already said this before, but I'll do it component by component wise. 
That was this was more of a general way to think about it. You know what asymptotics are, hopefully a little bit more. So you can kind of right, right in your brain just hold on to the idea of going like Dijon layer is really the singular term in my full equations. But here's doing all the components to you know maybe convince yourself you know a little bit more about it. But all this stuff is so restricted in like the actual components um, that I think maybe you get sometimes you get a false sense of um, understanding just from like doing the 2D case every component. Um, I personally think this is more general to think about how this stuff is going on. Okay, so then these are just natural scales to pick. Again, why do I pick this scale for the pressure? Why? I'm gonna, I don't know how many times I'm going to say I'm going to test you on this. I'm picking that scale for the pressure because I said the Reynolds number is large for all this theory to happen. Right? Asymptotically in my expansion, I said the Reynolds number is going to infinity. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I have certainly have, I have a very large right, velocity occurring. So if I took some domain or region of fluid, right, if I oops, took my microphone, bad, bad. If I took some box of fluid and looked at the flow that's happening inside of it, right, and I just looked at the scalar values of there and I thought about the energies, most of that box is energy is going to be associated to the kinetic energy per unit volume because I have this high speed going on in there. So that is why I'm picking this pressure scale. If it was Stokes flow and I had a very small Reynolds number, this would be the wrong pressure scale. Because again, if I looked at my box of fluid and I just thought about what's the energy going to happen in that box, well, it's mostly going to be this viscous friction. Or right, it's, it's a, the frictional energy per unit volume. Because that viscous, that viscous energy has got to be going somewhere. It ends up going to heat. <clears throat> OK, so that's the idea of imagining if you have this box of fluid or a domain of fluid, you go, what's the flow look like and where's the energy happening? That helps you pick your pressure scale. X is not that hard. I think everyone can imagine that the X would be the L. OK, and then the Y, you don't know what this is. You don't know what the viscous length scale is. Well, you really do. We did the vorticity thing. You kind of go like, oh, it's the square root of, you know, you know, it's, you know it's coming. You know it's coming. But this is how it originally was done by Prandtl back in the day, where he just kind of had this 2D image in his head, and he just kind of went along at it. OK, so this is, this is the goal, right? So from these equations, it's simply find find those three functions. And drop the paper. Find these three functions. Par. This is a system of partial differential equations. <clears throat> So what do we do? We simplify things somewhat. <clears throat> need to we need to simplify this somehow. <clears throat> so I know what u scale is. Why do I know what u scale is? Well, I told you to do it that way. Um, no, I mean it's just you. You know, you you're gonna scale the you're gonna you're gonna scale the streamwise or inviscid flow by what you know of. I mean, even if this was kind of weird going into it with like some different variations, this could be some average. But the idea that the the perpendicular flow is what's gonna govern this streamwise coordinate. So that's what's gonna be the u in my situation. The v you don't know what that is. Okay, what have I said every single time? What equation do you use to relate velocities? What's the equation you should go into your head if I go, I know one velocity, what should the other one be? I wish I had a class here and you would be very silent and then no one would say anything. But then maybe someone would. Okay, I've said many, many times continuity. Continuity relates your velocities. So I did it in Jeffrey Hamill flow, and I like that example, and I do it all the time. Um, but just like, just like here, right? So if I want to get a handle on what's the V scale, I go to continuity. And it's a very classic thing. You even did it in your homework.
Okay, and then in a scale sense, you figured out what the perpendicular velocity is. And what is it saying? Well, it's saying something, right? It'd be the, idea, the idea that you have this scale relationship, it's saying that, okay, the perpendicular velocity, the velocity moving off of this boundary layer, so this is sort of my scale v, this would be my scale u. This one, right, this u velocity, when you say it scales like that, makes sense because it's like mostly like that. We didn't know what this one is, but with respect to the laws of conservation of mass, you then derive it looks like that. And you've already said one thing about this around viscous length scale, and there's multiple ways, I think, to assume it, right? You could go to the vorticity equation and figure out what this viscous length scale is as well, or you just understand that, okay, well, the viscous length scale is much less than the, is, is just much, much less than the, than the streamwise, than the characteristic length on the body. Not that hard to imagine. So then you get this relationship, and that's just telling you, right, that this velocity away from the plate, no matter what it is, is just orders of magnitude smaller than the streamwise one. And that is that this, this is the dominant, right, this is the dominant flow of energy. So for these equations to hold, this is important. People forget about this, I think. Because at separation, right, when boundary, when boundary layers separate, what happens? When a boundary layer separates, right, this characteristic scale, like this, or this area, right, it goes away very, very quickly. So this breaks down, and nothing works past there. So even this little tiny calculation for continuity in terms of boundary layer velocities, this has to hold because I'm going to substitute this back into these, all these equations. So this must be the case, right? Remember, really, this is some x in there. It's a function of the, right? It's a function along the body itself. So this could change. At separation, this got so big, this is not the case anymore. It's not the scale. OK, so most importantly, though, you just get that relationship. That the scale for the y velocity is this. Very simple calculation, all coming from continuity, governed by the idea that I want to know what the, how to relate these velocities. <clears throat> Now, what do you think we're going to do? Well, I have this scale. I have y scale. I have x scale. I have pressure scale. I now have the v scale. What do you do? Well, you plug it all back in there, and now you have the totally non-dimensional equations. Continuity, right, you've already said these things balance, so that will look the same. This equation will just be stars everywhere, nothing to write home about. <clears throat> OK, non-dimensionalizing the full-on momentum equations now inserting this velocity relation gives us some stuff. All right, so first term looks like this. Second term looks like this, right? And this substitution is because of what I, because of continuity. Algebra will work out like this. And then here I have This, boom, boom, and then here, I'll write it like this, just so we can, yeah, I just want you to see something. This is the x momentum equation, right? Where really there's a really there's a star oper there's a whole star derivative term right here, a star derivative term right here. These are all the same terms are in front of them. I've just written them down in this order sense. Where here's the leading coefficient, non-dimensional grade, non-dimensional derivative term, coefficient, non-dimensional derivative term. My hand gets tired, so I'm not writing it on the board. But you understand, hopefully, I mean that I have these commas. I can put the pluses in here. Next one. So then the second one. Same thing. And 
And I'm writing this like this just momentum. Okay, continuity ends up just being order one, order one equals the order one, order one. Okay, so here are them. And then what I do here is you then divide by the likest term, right? So you really are sort of saying, okay, well, I'll normalize by this row u squared divided by the L. It popped up in the most places, so that's a good way to do. But really, normalize all of your equations then By that term, right? So you normalize it. And then what occurs, right, is you have this order one term. Terrible. Order one. It's a negative one, but it doesn't really matter. See how I, that's why, that's, that's why I wrote it like that. Um. No, there's no squared there. So this is the x. So I'm just rewritten this in just these scale terms, right? So I have this, all the all the term, right? All the functional things we have look like this. Every term in this equation, okay? And on this side, these are the inertial terms. Pressure terms. These are the viscous terms. They're the curvature terms. Okay. So now the question is, how can we get a match, right? How can I get inertia to balance viscous somehow in this flow to happen, right? If you don't do that, then there's no way of matching this viscous and inertial flux. There's, right, I couldn't, if, if right, the inertial term, the inertial terms are all order one in the x momentum equation. That's going to be dom, dom, dominating the motion happening along the body right here. The y is a different story. Just focusing on the x momentum equation, I have all inertia order one right now. Pressure's order one. This one's one with Reynolds right now, right? And I have the fact that I'm going to have Reynolds go really large. So that's the end of the story for this one right here. But I can rescale this one so that it doesn't go to, so I, so I can retain that in the limit. So if I'm looking only at x momentum, I'm saying, crap, I have no luck on that one. Right? As Reynolds goes to infinity, right, that one's out. My last ditch effort is this, right, is this one right here. My last ditch effort is the curvature normal to the body coordinate. And it has this relationship to the viscous length scale. 
And what is that, Ralph? It's this classic relationship. I, show, I told you I would get this through scaling. seen this before, but it, right, the idea is that in this y curvature term, when I looked at all my scales, natural one, the y is the viscous length scale, pressure is not too bad of a one, it's, it's dominated by the good choice that Reynolds is getting large, x is the body length, I have no interaction occurring between the viscous terms and the, and the, viscous, uh, the viscous terms and the inertial terms unless I have this condition here. I can get this to be order 1, right, 1, 1, 1, and then 1, if this condition holds. So the boundary layer is really proportional to the square root of the Reynolds due to that fact, right? And really what's happening is just that rescaling that we did for singular asymptotic problems, right? You're just looking for the magnification term in that y coordinate, and it's like this, and it ends up being this, the square root. Fantastic. I did a little more steps with this order stuff, but it doesn't really, but I did a little more steps with this order stuff. Um, you can just see every step. So that's the idea that, right, I want to retain viscous terms and inertial terms. And the only way to do that is in this term right here in the x momentum. Now, this is no hope here because this is epsilon, epsilon, um, really big, uh, less big, uh, smallish. OK, so now plug this back in this. So now let's just plug this back into these terms right here. Well, that makes this order 1. Ooh, so I have, a, I have a dominant physics playing out in the boundary layer. So the x momentum equation are the dominant physics occurring in the boundary layer. right? The dominant physics being the inertia happening in there, these equations, and that. And then the y momentum is a different story. OK, so now this equation is of an order negative 1 half. This is now order negative one half. This is one half. What do I have here? Now I have this, it's a one over Reynolds. So this is three halves, negative three halves. Okay, so now I have Reynolds. So this is a Reynolds, and it's a square root, so I had to have order three half. Okay, so now I have a consistent system, and I can retain things as I keep Reynolds limits, right? Same thing here. So here, there you go, right there. This is a y momentum right here. This is the rescaled y momentum equation, right? So. I can get things to stay in the limits, right, if I do one thing, right? If I multiply everything, or if I divide everything by a 1 over Reynolds half on this equation, okay, <clears throat> pushing that through, algebra does commute with the orders notations. Now I have Reynolds to negative 1, half to Reynolds to negative 1. This becomes an order 1 term as well. Um, this becomes Reynolds squared. This now becomes Reynolds as well. Now in my limits, as Reynolds goes to infinity, right, everything checks out, okay? In this equation, I have the first order dynamics occurring, where I have this, this property, this property, this property, this property. I have this pressure term retaining in the, in the y momentum. And then... The continuity doesn't do much, right? Because all that says continuity is just, right, it's still just one, one. And then you can't say little o, you can't say anything capital O is equal to zero, but you can say um, that it's equal to little o one. If you remember those definitions, that's an okay thing to say. Some people think that little o, I, I think little o came about because Instead of writing 0, you can actually just write <laughs> this little o to a constant. It could be any constant in there, actually. It could be, even be, it could be a Google. <clears throat> OK. 
So now we get the famous, sort of the baby Navier-Stokes equations almost, because they've been studied so much, right? And what are they? So I have inertial term, inertial term, inertial term, inertial term. So what is the order one system? What is the most dominant solution part behavior? What is my first term expansion in my asymptotic solution to this problem? Order one, so I keep this term, I keep this term, I keep this pressure term, I don't keep this pressure term because Reynolds goes a number, that thing is negligible. So I get rid of this term. Sorry, I should have had. Okay, and then for the order one system, the pressure term in the Y is what we're looking at. So everything goes away except this. <clears throat> and that's your order one system for the Van der Waals equations. All through a scale balance of just terms that we have. And then a rescaling happening right here. This was a rescaling that occurred. The rescaling in an asymptotic sense was I have a boundary layer phenomena where I need to rescale my coordinate close to the surface. I need to find a different scaling for y. And that scaling for y involves this delta term. And now what we're after is we're actually trying to figure out what the delta of x is. I know a relationship, right? I mean, you really you have this idea that delta, right, that the delta the boundary layer is proportional. One over the Reynolds number, Reynolds squared over the Reynolds number. But we don't really have actually like a, a, a good, um, in a general sense, that um, delta of x. What else do we have? These things comes with conditions. So we have no slip conditions. The u and the v velocity at y is equal to 0 must be no slip. The limit as my perpendicular coordinate away from the wall of my x and y must match up with my far field, right? Much match up with my far field solution. This is really a matching condition, OK? This is really a condition saying that this solution must meet up with the outer solution. So some people have a matching principle. I think of matching principles as really just a boundary condition for, some, for um, uh, consistency. So these are BCs. These are PDEs. And then you also need an IC to fix one more thing, an initial condition. I say initial condition. Okay, because I only have functions of x and y. I mean, it's a steady state problem, so it's u of x and y and v of x and y. <clears throat> if that's the case, so that and he's also assigned then that the incoming part, so let's say this point right here is my x naught, so really at zero, sometimes we say this. So really you should probably think of this as just zero. It could be anything as the as the important part and kind of the issues of PDEs is you can just assign this initial thing to be zero. Like you never assign your you never assign like your um, time or initial condition for a, a dynamic problem to be like time at time equal to three. It's this and then integrate forward. You usually always just say time equal to zero. Same same shit's going on here. And then this g of y is any function, right? So then the g of y is an incoming velocity profile. And we now need to see conditions of what, right, of conditions of what these things can be. A little scale argument. Okay, boundary layer theory has to involve Reynolds numbers getting large. If it doesn't, it's a different theory. It's called Stokes flow, and that's next lecture. I'm trying to stop solving problems and just start talking about fluids. All right. So those are that right again. That's the solution. 
right? I full, right? This is the idea that under some assumptions I've made, under physical reasonings about flows and large Reynolds numbers and asymptotics, etc., that's it. These set of equations define the u, the v, and then the p indirectly. So that would be it, right? I mean, right, and then however you want to solve this thing is the next step. Not the most important step. It certainly is not the most important step. The most important step in analysis is not saying the flow solves the Navier-Stokes equations. We're not here to do that. We're always here to come up with arguments to simplify the full Navier-Stokes equations. There's always a lot at your belt. You got 2D, good one. You get a uh, 1D, actually not 1D. You got 2D flow. You get um, steady state flow, always a good one as well. Um, you know, symmetry, uh, symmetry conditions, we say no, no subs included in the, in the boundary conditions. But I mean, but just that, that's the point, right? That, that, that like, this really is it, right? And Prandtl, right, Prandtl published this first and then later did this trickery later and then Faulkner Scan developed on it later. Um, but this is the idea that given all of these uh, assumptions that are physical and they looked at a lot of data and, sh and shows that like these, this seems to be the way it has to be going and it seems consistent with our equations. It's cool stuff. So I'm going to go over them again, right? We got steady state, right? We have the, this boundary layer that I don't know. I just know it's much, much less than this. Truly, we have this that, right? One over the one over the square root of the Reynolds number must be essentially less than one. Not even, not actually much less than one. That's too much, because the first term is still good enough. <laughs> Um, but you would need to do higher ones. So let's go with this, right? This does have some power associated to it as well, right? Because one, right, a square root, right, this lowers numbers, large numbers get smaller under square roots, right? So if you had, right, if you had a Reynolds number that's like, right, 10 to the 4, right, that's, Ten thousand, right? That's a pretty large, right? That's a pretty large Reynolds number, right? So then, right, the square root of that is just a hundred, right? It's a pretty large Reynolds number to really just have one over a hundred occurring in the equations asymptotically, right? Not really. Not the best. So I think maybe even in that sense, this is kind of neat to see. The square root is almost like, right, that almost makes sense whenever I have to remember about external flows. What's the critical Reynolds number, right? A critical Reynolds number is this issue of, I think it's, it's 10 to the 5. Yeah, 10 to, right? it's got to be 10 to the 5. Well, square root of this, right, that's going to be, Almost, <laughs> not exactly. You know, almost a thousand. So one over a thousand, you know, one over a thousand is pretty good. I'll take it over one over a hundred. Certainly governs a small number. <clears throat> okay, another implicit one we also said was a smooth surface. And then... Another implicit one, something we'll talk about later, and you come back to this later, is that is G can't be a separated flow. Um, and then we'll have conditions for that. We'll just do some conditions later. But this is equivalent to saying that the incoming function G, the incoming function G can't have zero The incoming velocity profile can't have zero shear on the boundary, or else you would have separated flow. We'll see why that is. Smooth surface is actually that curvature. The 
curvature small locally. So right, our, our, our bodies look like this, our smooth bodies. <laughs> smooth body. <laughs> My smooth body. <laughs> No, so, so right, you have this smooth curvature occurring, and you don't have these kinks happening in the, in the body. Okay, but even still, right, the idea is that you, this theory would still work here, it would still work here. It's just not going to work there or in this corner right there. You have to be in the smooth part of it. And then the rest of them are sort of all summarized right there. We'll come back to this, and then we come back to this one right now. One more time. Well, we're going to go over. All you do is go over, Sam. Okay. So let's look at that outer flow solution. Outer flow solution. Okay. The outer flow solution at steady state is this. Okay, it's an exact derivative right here because I'm saying that u prime close to here is just as a function of x as I go down the, um, as I go down, right? And there's another thing that there's really, really, it's, you know, really, really you have to say this actually. Yeah, so let's, so it's sort of, remember the Poiseuille thing where I say like, oh, a function can't be a, a right, a function can't be a um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Right? So this equation is telling you that the pressure is only a function of x. It is not a function of x and y, because when I took this partial derivative of it, it was equal to 0. So that means that I don't need a partial right here. It means the pressure gradient is a pure, right, a, right, an ordinary derivative, capital D, not partial. Right? The, pressure grade, right, the pressure function is only a value of x. And that then means that for all of these things to hold, right? If this was a function of s, I could have had a partial here, but that wouldn't be the case. It has to be a function of x. So now you have all the exact derivatives occurring here. And this is the hardest um, thing to internalize about boundary layer flows. You do your swappity swap. And you get this relationship for the outer flow that's going to be happening. So the outer flow solution close to the surface, that means I've zoomed in close to here to get this relationship. It tells you that the outer flow, only a function of x, so I've zoomed in close. Okay, even I'm in this situation, I'm in this, I'm in this thing in my mind, I zoom close in, and the smoothness, the smooth assumption allows me to imagine this as a flat plate if I'm close enough, so this is flat. <clears throat> that is sort of now getting me to this situation here. It doesn't matter where I am right here. This is really going to end up being my boundary layer. So, so here's this x. So what's happening on here is this inner solution that's happening. <clears throat> what's happening here is this outer flow, the u infinity. And I now realize it's a function of x. Okay. Function of x, as I go downstream, the pressure gradient is what drives the change in this stream flow. OK, so that is the hardest thing maybe to internalize this, this simple conclusion right here. That pr the negative of pressure gradients change the magnitude of change. Right, so this is square, right? It's a square, right? So sine didn't really matter. Originally, velocity has a direction associated to it, but not here. Here, it's a square. So changes in speed, speed, are associated to the pressure gradient. Very important. Tells you a lot of stuff. Okay, what does it exactly tell you? Uh, where are my case? Okay, so then, then this is the idea. So then, if I have then. Negative pressure gradient. Speeding up. Positive pressure gradient. Sorry, I should say accelerating. These are the conclusions from this wonderful relationship of the outer flow. Right? Because of the negative outside, and density is always a positive number, if I have a negative pressure gradient, 
that corresponds to accelerating flow. Another way to think about that is the other way I think about it between two streamlines, right? If my flow has to accelerate, that means it has to, there has to be some contraction of a pipe flow, and that must associate to some negative pressure gradient, right? As the pressure begins to increase, this must mean a deceleration of flow, the pressure gradient, the pressure gradient increasing. It's associated to an acceleration of flow or speeding up. <clears throat> So now let's look about the separation. Okay, the separation, this idea that the g of y can't be a separated flow. So what is separated flow really talking about? It's talking about this issue, um, a couple ways to think about it. It's talking about this issue, how much time have I got? It's talking about this issue of this outer flow decelerating. So some flow has to be slowing down somewhere within this boundary layer. And you get these, this, this, this. So this is the point of separation. These are just other points. Okay, and if I were to draw this over here, if I just sort of track the line, right? As I move down the x, as I move further and further down the x direction, this is growing larger and larger by a square root relationship with the Reynolds, and at some point, it will get to this point S, which is called separation. What happens after separation is the wake. Right? So this speed of flow is getting slower and slower and slower. Right? The shear stress is, is, right, the shear stress is happening so long, eventually it slows down here. And then you get the situation of backflow, right? where now it will end up looking like this. And at that point, within the boundary layer, you, or within the boundary layer, this is the point of separation. Any point after this, it would continue to move backwards that way. So the infinitesimal next point next to separation, what's occurring, right, is some rotational flow occurring. This is that rotational wake. Because then at the wall, you would then have flow moving opposite to the streamwise velocity, the inviscid flow. That is what separation is talking about. Not race these. There is some point x where this happens, and it's happening because of this deceleration of flow. Deceleration of flow is causing it. Um, another way to think about this, right, is this idea. I think I drew it before, but let's do this, right? I mean, this is characterized by, I mean, this is characterized by right, by the, the this is characterized, right, at this situation where I then have flow moving the opposite direction, well, the next stage, this then means the derivative at zero, right, the slope of the, the slope of the velocity at zero must be zero at this very point, and this talks about then shear at the wall. So when the shear at the wall, the moment it changes sign, that's when separation occurs, or separation of boundary layer. Now why do you call it separation? It's called separation and it's, uh, for an unfortunate reason, because it makes you think somehow that the flow is like left, <laughs> but it didn't leave. It's the idea that eventually I have these streamlines. There's this point S. Right? After point S, the flow is looking like this. 
in terms of streamlined coordinates. Fantastic. Purely the most descriptive picture of separation I've at least heard. Because this point x equal, this is the idea that the boundary layer equations no longer hold after the point of separation. The boundary layer equations stop right here. After that point, you only you would have new. It just becomes pure inviscid flow past that point. So these equations do not hold past the point of inviscid, of, of these two do not hold past the point of separation. Separation is characterized by this condition right here. I mean, the shear has changed sign. The shear stress at the wall has changed sign. It means the boundary layer has separated. And it also talks about points of inflection. Let me get this. This is made right. The separated flow being this situation. Right? These, and these, this is extremely hard to actually experimentally do. But this is, right, in, in the most ideal sense, that's what's occurring in the flow. The wake behind is the idea that the, that the flow had, had slowed down so much that eventually this flow has to penetrate this word and then go into the, uh, then the, this flow has to go towards here and then move back out towards the inviscid flow solution part. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to do the Fox's thing right now. There's a whole thing about the curvature condition as well, but let's just start on with the, let's just start on then with then solving the boundary layer equations. But importantly, I'm just trying to get that across with this, with this idea that the separation, what's happening at the separation is that just these boundary layer equations stop holding. And they stop holding because you no longer have this laminar flow in the inferior. You have a highly rotational flow not governed by the same set of equations that we had. I mean, in fact, what happens, the point after separation, um, you, get a, you get just a massive jump that happens. Hey, microphone. Right? So taking this a little further down. So after the point of separation, what happens, you almost get this, you just get this discontinuous jump and then like moves into a turbulent boundary layer, the, ter boundary layer. This is called transitional. Turbulent flow past there. But clearly something really bad happened, right? If I call this a turbulent run, right? You could have the exact same scales happening in your uh, equations, but it's not going to work because what failed was that assumption that this is not true anymore, right? That sudden expansion or this rotational energy that now has to move into the flow must expand this to, right, to uptake that much. I mean, really what's happening after the point of separation, you know experimentally the flow becomes three-dimensional and you get this swirl oil happening. So right at this point, there's just a bunch of vortices. There's lines of vortex just moving off the airfoil itself and just creating a bunch of rotational energy. Right here, it's just all linear. Right, right here, it's just all linear momentum or linear kinetic energy. A past point separation. Now a bunch of rotational energy is into the mix, and this layer is, doesn't hold anymore. <clears throat> okay. So now Faulkner scan. Now Faulkner scan. Now we solve all of them. So this is a wonderful point when you go, I've got enough intuition maybe about this boundary layer. I understand all the assumptions that go into it. Now let me try to solve the thing and then calculate things past there. I won't have time to actually calculate out like the shear stress or the idea, but I already showed you we do make these plots um, and go, see how you would be able to get the shear stress up the wall? Same thing's going to go for all of these solutions. Faulkner scan. Okay, so the first right, so the first thing, right, is that all the assumptions are satisfied. Stream function approach. Let's look instead for a potential function. Right? All the all, right, all the assumptions of that all the assumptions were satisfied for that equation. Why would you do a stream function? If you remember, stream functions automatically satisfy, right, the way they're defined, they automatically satisfy continuity. So remember, a stream function, it's a potential function in the sense that
right? It's definition, automatically satisfy continuity, and then the only order equation I have is that x momentum equation. What do I get there? Well, some of you maybe remember that you actually could have started from here and not done the components of the Navier Stokes equations. You could have just said, wait a minute, all the assumptions of the stream functions are satisfied. I'm going to go uh, do that. You can do that. I substitute in the pressure. And then you get this equation for the stream function. Still dimensional, haven't non, I haven't, non, I haven't non-dimensionalized this equation yet. Okay? We can leave the non-dimensionalization later. But you could then move on to non-dimensionalization. So we do the same scales, really, because the scales will still pan out this way. This is that. This is that. Okay? So only difference is you now need to scale... Yes. Yes. Where is this where is this coming from? This idea of the stream function comes from this integration this integrating it. So wherever I am then I have of stream function, this part, and the other part ends up looking like this. And what does this mean? This means that Because this is zero. No slip. <clears throat> so that's just the motivation of what that scale is. The same thing of just integrating the stream functions. It also could, could get that way. Um, So now you plug everything in to this continuity equation here, and you will get then u infinity time I've just I've done nothing but substitute in all of these scale relationships, non-dimensionalize them, and put them back in there. That's that's all that's happening right now. And then a Reynolds number will cancel out. I don't have Reynolds number right here. Um. Did I have a, oh, and then this all actually equals this term. where f is just the non-dimensional stream function. Okay, 
We'll just call it f. We don't care about the stars around. And then eta, right, is going to be non dimensional. And then L will actually leave everything, I believe. Yes. So a bunch of stuff here. You need to collect things. And you collect things and make these pretty math expressions. And that is, say, I'm going to call a common term here external prime. And then a common term here. Prime, everywhere in here. Okay, again, I, I mean it's not. I, I mean, I mean, I write these steps out, but right, the idea is like you had the equations, you had the solution. Now you're attacking some type of solution from that. You're using a stream function approach, right? You integrate the stream function to say, well, a good scale for this would be this over this, right? You're trying to find this f term. Same thing with a derivative of the stream function. Remember, like you u. I'm going to write the stream function lectures, I think. Maybe like connect dots. But then you're really just substituting things back in. And then things will then cancel out. Yeah. And then, you're and then, and then collecting like terms is the other important part. Okay, so all of that together, so this is, I had no room, so I go to the thing. Redefining these things leads you to the equation form of this. Triple derivative, the alpha So that's the simplified one given my redefinitions of the alphas and the betas. All right. So here's the problem with this. Yeah, with this. It, is simple, wait, it is simpler, but we need to do more work on the simplification, right? Because of a major issue happening. We have not eliminated a coordinate yet. Right? Writing this all out. I have a function, right, f, and f is the non-dimensional stream function, so it's still really a function of x and y, where this is now of eta. This alpha is a function of x, delta is a function of x, u of prime we know is a function of x, and that comes from the relationship of continuity. So I know that alpha is only a function of x as of now. And then so is beta. All right? So this is a problem because now the solution f, which I'm looking for, the non-dimensional stream function, it's still going to involve x's in it. It won't be independent. But I can, right, I can have f be only a function of eta. Alpha and beta are constant values. So realize that, right? Before you have this assumption that I know that the, u, that the u of infinity is equal to x, I know that the delta is equal to x as I move down the plate itself. All I did was just substitute things and redefine things as well. And I have a simpler equation, at least looks simpler. But the problem is the output or the solution of this prior to this would really still would just be, right, I still have a PDE, right, before, right? Because I have x's and I have eta's around everywhere. I mean, I have d, I have, these are d, d, eta's on the other side, but they would be partial. I could turn from partial to exact, right? I could, do, right? I could go from a partial eta to a d, d, eta if I make this constant. And then it wouldn't depend on any x. And this is the concept of similarity solutions, right? We're looking for similarity solutions for this boundary layer. Why are you looking for similarity solutions? Well, because they go. 
Right? It's a good place to start, similarity solutions. There's concepts of triangles and things like that, but I'm going to step aside on, on the why looking for similarity solutions because you know, it, seems like every, every, it seems every day I watch one YouTube video or another, read another chapter of a book where someone has a different description of what a similarity solution is and why you want one. So I think everyone should just come up with their own rationales why you look for a similarity solution. I think you look for similarity solutions because I can't solve this analytically, but I can do a trick to make me solve it real. <laughs> Are we mad? That's the case. <clears throat> Constants. So what's better about that, though, is these are two equations. Right? Here are two equations and two unknowns for conditions for the u of infinity function and the d of x function and the delta function. Beautiful, right? All I set out before was just that u infinity. These are from the general boundary layer conditions, any boundary layer um, equations. And they began with me saying, right, pressure, right, the pressure gradient in the y direction is equal to 0, so that means it's a constant value. So the u of prime has to be a function of x. This is the idea that pressure is impressed upon the boundary layer. And then you have this delta. Well, in the scale sense, I know it's related, it's related to the Reynolds number. But I mean, in terms of actually writing out what the function is, it changes based on how, right? It just, it's going to change based on how the inviscid flow speeds up or slows down. And these solutions are telling you that. You're deriving two equations and two unknowns. Again, and the second step coming from I'm looking for this equation to be simpler, and it becomes an ODE when alpha and beta are constant values. <clears throat> so then tr you know, chug along and try to solve these two equations. And then essentially the trick is you go, wait a minute, 2 alpha minus beta is equal to this. It's not impossible to get that on your own. You would just like expand something out and go, hey, wait a minute, same thing. <clears throat> OK, this tells you then Okay, and this still is actually saying that it's proportional to the one over a right square root of Reynolds number because if you right delta over L, you would non-dimensionalize this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now the big thing is right this alpha and beta that can be any two constants, right? They, all all, all I make the only condition I'm having is just that alpha and beta are just two numbers, and that they're free they're free to me to for, for, they're free for me to change anything really. So then you have, this, you, have to, you have to fix something of them, right? This may be a little, <clears throat> maybe a little strange to do, right? So then if that's, the case, if that's the case, if I can have, if I really have any two numbers, right, if I'm having any two numbers, So sort of pick any two alphas and betas such that they're equal to 1, plus or minus 1, really. They would change based on signs. Well, if that's the case, then I now have a, just essentially a simpler version of a plus or minus right? where I have the plus case. I still have, I'm free to pick the alphas and betas any way I want. <clears throat> what do I have here? What 
did I do here? What did I do here? What did I do here? I did. Okay. Now that I have that, oh, okay. Now that I have that, I plug this back in here, right? Because I solved for what the delta was, two equations, two unknowns. Plug it back in there. I then get this beta relationship, which was what? So then I have the beta is equal to minus plus. Ooh. And then the beta equals minus plus x rho x, and then the dp dx. Well, really, that is a plus minus x. That's the good way of looking about it, right? Yeah, you're just plugging. You're, right, you're just you're just doing the two equations, two unknowns, with this relationship, and then, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then you integrate this, right? You separate, and integrate, and then this then tells you. You can figure out what these flung, right? You figure out the form at least of the inviscid flow. And that means that for a consistent set of equations for the Faulkner scan similarity solutions, it looks like this, where m positive beta f and then negative beta f Impressive, right? I mean, so, so fixing this, fixing the solutions of these general boundary conditions, right, where I'm allowing the, where I'm allowing the inviscid flow to vary with x because of pressure gradient, you're still constrained to have two functional forms of solutions, right? The boundary layer looks like this, where it's just proportional to 1 over the Reynolds number, where you take an L out and it would still look like that. And then similarly for the U, you then derive that it has to look like a power law with some value m. And m and beta are now related. What's that relation? So then you solve for, OK, yeah. So then you just solve for, get, right, given this m of beta, you can figure out right that beta setting alpha equal to 1. It may seem weird that you've characterized almost everything, but um, it didn't really matter that if I pick, right, the, it, didn't, it doesn't really matter, right, that it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> right, you, you set one of these and you can solve for what all the betas are. Importantly, though, that the beta m, right, the beta is still related to somehow that external flow, right? The solution of the two equations, two unknowns, start off with this way. You say, well, I have two constants, I'll set one of them, I'll just make that this equal to, I'll just have that set equal to one or negative one. And then it's true for any betas and alphas I have right here. And that just makes this equation simpler, which you then plug back in. And that allows you to derive that it must be some power form. And then you can plug it back in for your beta, no matter what um, m you have, given that the alpha is equal to 1. These, I'm just saying these, con the, these, these situations are not like physical constraints where something would fail. This is still in the most general case. You're just picking a way to generalize to all solutions. And then that's it. Then you have now the real, the simpler solution would be Faulkner scan similarity solutions for the boundary layer. Right? And you can code them on your computer now and do many things. But now analysis is just easier on these equations than it would be for the full Navier Stokes equations. That's the point. Right. What is this one? Class. This is just right, this is that matching principle. This is saying that as I approach infinity, I must right, I must get that V I must have that velocity that I want recovered. Yes. Yes. Okay, same thing with here, and then same thing with here. Yeah, right, as I get to, as I get to right, right, at zero, I have a constant value, then this one, the V, must be a constant value as well. Amazing. 
<clears throat> but there's something cool happening with this solution, and that is this power and dominance of the m exponent in there. The only solution forms I have must come like this, right? It's only I have a, right, this condition that the exterior flow must be coming from some power relationship looking like this. Now, what does that look like? Well, we already did that, and that was this potential flow problem where we had right the great right, we had the complex pull up, we had the complex potential, and you had all these different situations. So, in this equation, you have every single boundary layer problem. For m equal to zero, this is something called the Blasius, is right or flat plate solution. Right, when the power is between 0 and 1, this is, this is going to be a flow on a wedge. Uh, m equal 1, this, way back ago, remember, this is really that Hyman's flow. This couples, and this, this is the coupling that's happening, where now m is equal to 1 is really this rotation of thing where it's just a flat plate. 1, 2. This is flow in a corner. People still write papers on this thing. And then for this, you don't really have a simple analogy or like something. It just, it's just sort of just more corners. Now, the condition where my exponent is less than negative 1, you get that Jeffrey Fantastic. Um, and sort of if you want to consider boundary layers, this, this is the solution, then, for all these types of cases. And these people come up and they just analyze all these situations and go, wait a minute, that's what this is saying. So that means that this boundary layer is describing this solution right here, where this is a flat plate, right? Flow on a wedge, same thing. I just have this wedge like here. And now I have these boundary layers occurring on the outside as it moves outside. And then for this situation like this, I have this Hyman's flow or a stagnation flow like that. Um, this situation like here, this is one of these situations depending on, right, depending on where the m is, you then parameterize some sort of alpha and it looks like this, right, where you're looking at now the boundary layers happening here and of here, essentially there are closed loops happening in there. Um, as it gets passed into, there's no, there's uniqueness breakdown, so that doesn't work. And then Jeffrey Hamill flow, Right, this is the situation where we had this impinging wedge with an infinite sink source happening in there, and we had this um, opposite thing happening, right? Where flow had a little boundary layer in there, but it was now speeding up like that. And those are, that's really the this, is the, this is one of the most general, like, equations of a boundary layer you can get just because of all this power thing where you have a now conditional matching of all external flows that are valid, right? So you can really, you can really look at all these things. And it's important that M is actually like a round one because that's when all the dynamics are happening um, together. So note, right, so the idea is, right, you can't have M be too large because you'd then be losing inertia and viscous terms in this Blasius boundary layer condition. And this is an inner solution, right? So we don't, we can't, we're not going to, we don't in this case limit M to be infinity in one of these things and lose one of the terms because we, this is the rescaled problem where we have that inner dynamics of the boundary layer happening. So no rescaling. That's why these M's are always hanging around one. Because you don't want to, you need to retain every single term in here because every single term in here is talking about how the inertial forces balance the viscous forces. Which ones are they? You can imagine, right, the triple one, the triple one is your viscous terms and the rest are how the inertia is balancing it. And then the M parameter is a, the M parameter is coming outside. It must be, right, it must be some driving order one term 
and it must be around order one. It can't go to infinity in these boundary conditions. You then solve it in computer, you look at it, and then you calculate things. <clears throat> OK. So there's a lot more to talk about the boundary layer, right? There's a ton more to talk about the boundary layer. People talk for, I took a whole class in boundary layer once, but I had one to tell you the important parts about it. And that's really what we get at with boundary layer, right? Write down the Blasius, look at the M's, but understand the point of the boundary layer problem is it's, it is, it's, it's, it's displaying the asymptotic singular nature of the Navier-Stokes equations. And it's zooming in close to where the viscous force must connect with the inviscid force. And the most physical interpretations of boundary layer flows all come around from that early thing where eventually there has to have a separation occur where the assumptions that Prandtl came up with will fall apart. And they fall apart because that thing blows up too much because you have too much rotational flow happening close to the wall. And, before, and this is the advanced one, so I don't really do it right now. But if I, in my undergrad classes, I just give you the equations that this solution derives. Right? So the important thing is, if you did solve these and make tables, you could then make ta you could have tabulated values and create these coefficient of drag things. You can make tables for how, you know, the pressure coefficients. You could then calculate skin friction, which helps you calculate drag. For all of these cases. But I don't have any homework for that on you. I do. I have undergrad students. I make them do that. I just give them the equations. You technically have the power then to numerically tabulate, right? a pressure coefficient from these. And we've done it twice before, so we won't do it there. But importantly, boundary layers, are the, are, they, answer the, they answer the situation of how do the Navier-Stokes equations get down to no slip, and what does that layer look like? Past the point of boundary layer, cat's out the bag, right? Cat's out the bag, and that is that point after separation. What happens there can be modeled somewhat as ideal flow situation, but then you have these turbulent wake situations happening. Um, okay, next I'll talk about life at low Reynolds numbers.